Hi, Pandas and TKs. I hope you enjoyed uh, the last two chapters with Mr. Smith. Certainly some exciting adventures with uh, Alex returning and us finding about his past and Lil confronting Mr. Carter at the grand opening of the tomb. So I'm now here today to read you the final two chapters, uh, which makes up the last part, part five of Secrets of a Sun King. So I hope you enjoy and I will give you the uh, the quiz code at the end of the video so that you can take the AR quiz. Here we go, chapter 22. The very next day, Mr. Carter decided to put the record straight. He offered Mrs. Mendoza and Alex an exclusive interview, the only condition being that no children should be present. I was very glad to hear it. Frankly, I'd had enough of his stories. In a hired room at the Winter Palace, Mr. Carter came clean about what he called their preliminary viewing of the tomb that night. He had, without meaning to, put a piece of ancient plasterwork in his jacket pocket, but that was all accounted for now, no harm done. I imagined Mrs. Mendoza and Alex furiously writing all this down in their notebooks. They were certainly pretty thrilled with their final story, which was wired not to Mr. Pemberton at the Washington Post, but to the Cairo Gazette. An Egyptian story deserved an Egyptian publication, Mrs. Mendoza had said. Neither Lord Carnarvon nor Lady Evelyn took part in the interview. The exclusive deal they were pushing for was with the Times. According to Pepe though, the real reason was that Mr. Carter and Lord Carnarvon had been arguing over how best to clear the tomb. All their good fortune came at a price. You see, nobody, not even Mr. Carter, had expected the tomb to be so jammed full of treasure. Bizarrely, by being such a rushed, unroyal looking grave, Tutankhamun's official resting place had remained untouched like no other tomb before it, not even Kaiki's. Mr. Carter was very confident that when they opened the inner chamber, they'd find the young Pharaoh's remains intact. We kept quiet about that. Suffice to say, the story in the Cairo Gazette made life difficult for Mr. Carter. The call for more Egyptian involvement in the dig grew and Mr. Carter, stubborn as the donkeys he rode, locked the gate on the dig and declared the excavation season over until spring. Things were definitely not going to plan. Or, as Pepe put it, Tutankhamun's curse has turned its sights on Mr. Carter at last. When Mrs. Mendoza announced it was time for us to go home, I was both excited and apprehensive. I'd had no more news about Grandad, so I wasn't sure what exactly I'd find when I got to London. There were farewells to say to three old friends now together in their little clifftop tomb and to three new ones, Pepe, Charlie and Chaplin, who'd made me think about many things, including camels, in a whole different light. Tulip sobbed like a baby saying goodbye to Chaplin. <laughs> All right, she promised him. The look on Pepe's face was a picture. On our very last evening, when everyone else had gone to bed, I stayed up on deck by myself. As I lay there, listening to the river lapping gently against the boat's hull, I heard a rustling coming from the reeds on the riverbank. I sat up just in time to see a dog creep to the water's edge. It was only a couple of feet away, close enough to touch. I could see it wasn't a normal dog. It was bigger and quieter than the mangy strays from the town and its ears stuck up on the top of its head like an Anubis on Kaiki's jar. I wondered if it might be a jackal. I hoped it was. It felt right that it should be somehow. As the jackal started drinking, I kept absolutely still. 
Then it heard something in the distance and its head went up. It saw me watching it. For the tiniest moment, we stared right at each other before it turned tail and vanished. I'd like to think it was a sign that the gods of ancient Egypt were protecting Kaiki. Despite all Mr. Carter's digging and cataloguing, the real Tutankhamun was finally free. Six and a half days later, we were home. London was upon us all too quickly. In the suburbs, we passed acres and acres of new houses being built. After Cairo, the view from the window as we came into St Pancras station was grey, cold and dreary. Yet there were Christmas lights twinkling prettily in all the shops and a definite cosiness to all the lamplit windows and smoking chimney pots. Dear London, how I loved it. I was glad to be back. Mrs Mendoza had wired ahead to say we were returning. And there they were, both mum and dad, waiting at the ticket barrier. They had on their best coats and hats and their faces when they saw me coming made me well up with tears. I hesitated though when I spotted who else was there with them, wrapped up all warm against the cold. Though he looked small and pale, it was definitely an improvement on when I'd last seen him in a hospital bed. Besides, I'd have known those twinkling blue eyes anywhere. Grandad! I ran the last few yards, suitcase thumping against my leg. Grandad reached out his arms and I went straight into them. I buried my face deep into his coat. He smelled of old things and Nefertiti. Oh, Lily, he hugged me tightly, drew away to look at me and hugged me again. Hands patted my shoulders. I heard mum say my name, then dad clear his throat. We were all having a bit of a cry. There were more hugs, hands being shaken as the Mendozas joined us at the barrier. In the hustle and bustle of it all, I noticed granddad go very, very still. He'd been pale before, but now the colour completely went from his face. I panicked, thinking he was about to collapse or something. Do, do, do you need to sit down? I asked him. But it wasn't that he was ill. He'd seen someone behind me, over my shoulder. I turned around and there was Alex, looking every bit as startled himself. Chapter 23. Just because we'd broken the curse didn't mean the world made sense again. If anything, for a while at least, life got more complicated. One thing we did agree on was that St Pancras Station, with a ticket barrier wedged between us, wasn't the place to discuss it. So we all went back to Grandad's instead. As usual, we were greeted by Nefertiti and a hallway full of carpets and boxes. Yet, instead of taking us straight into the shop, Grandad ushered us upstairs to the front parlour. The last time he'd used this room was in 1918, when the war ended. So I knew he had something really important to tell us, which gave me the jitters all over again. <clears throat> I think everyone should sit down he said. Wiping off the layers of dust, we perched on what chairs or stools we could find. Oz, who'd taken an immediate liking to Nefertiti, sat with her on the floor. From a drawer, Grandad took out an envelope with photographs inside, which Mrs Mendoza seemed to recognise straight away. That's my writing, she cried in alarm. Grandad placed a hand on his chest. I'm Ezra Wilkinson, he explained. You've been sending me pictures of my grandson all these years. Her mouth fell open. And you're Mrs Mendoza, he said to her. Or should I say Mrs Fulbright? She nodded, 
looking worried. That, that was my first husband's name, yes. Are you following all this, Lil? Tulip whispered. I gulped. I think so. Though who knew that two families could be so complicated and complicated together? Certainly, Mum seemed to grasp what was going on because she'd got her hanky out and was dabbing at her eyes. Grandad laid out the photographs on the floor for us all to see. They were all of a blonde-haired boy, 16 in total, one for each year as a child. He'd got them in date order, starting with a baby in knitted booties, then a toddler on a swing. At least half of the pictures showed the boy holding some sort of silver cup or certificate. The last was of a young man in army uniform, Alex. It was ridiculous, totally and utterly. Yet, when I glanced at Mum, she was shaking with tears. All these years you've been in touch and never told me, she cried, staring at Grandad. My dear, I thought it was for the best, he replied, though he looked very unsure about it. Dad kissed the top of Mum's head, telling her it would be all right. Alex, Tulip's brother Alex, looked the most confused of any of us. Well, he said, running a hand through his floppy hair, this is rather a surprise. But you told me your baby was called Ezra, I said to Mum. He was, Lil, Mrs Mendoza answered for her. He still is. But we call him by his middle name. Don't ask me why. It's just always been that way. I felt dizzy. Ever since Mum had told me the secret, I'd been imagining where my brother might now be. And this past week or more, he'd been right under my nose. It really was too bizarre to be true. But then, come to think of it, so was a pharaoh's curse and a 3,000-year-old heart wrapped up in a jar. Ezra Alexander, I said, though I couldn't begin to think what his surname might be. Gosh, I mean, I'm not sure how to say this, but do you mind being my brother? Alex puffed out his cheeks shook his head, then smiled. <laughs> Actually, Lil, I've been meaning to thank you for the glass of lemonade. You were kind to me that day when you didn't even know me, so I couldn't wish for a better, braver sister. Tulip grinned. Oh, I'll pretend I didn't hear that. Afterwards, Tulip said I'd gone a very funny shade of grey, so I suppose it was the shock. And I was happy. I really, really was. Though happiness that te huge takes a little bit of getting used to. But I did get used to it. Our little family suddenly felt stronger and bigger. Not just with the addition of Alex, but the Mendozas too. And as I got to know Alex, it helped me understand Dad more and more. There was no denying how delighted he was to find his son. Yet, I also came to know the signs that showed he loved me just as much. All the pushing, the university talk, it was about wanting me to have the same opportunities, the same chances as any boy would have. When men try to change the world, it ends up with fighting, he said to me one day when we were on our own making supper. Girls, like you and Tulip, you're the future. You'll use, you will use your brains to get things done. It changed the way I saw St Kilda's. So did the fact that Tulip now came to school and Millicent Thorpe gave us both a wide berth, which made me wonder if Mrs Emerson Jones had actually listened the day she birched me. Though nothing, and I mean nothing, could ever make me like the stupid St Kilda's felt hat. Alex, meanwhile, went back to living with the Mendozas, but came to us for his roast lunch every Sunday. 
Grandad would come along too, and Dad actually didn't mind. The arrival of Alex had healed their rift, which I suspected had all along been to do with the baby they'd given away. Perhaps if Grandad had been here and not in Egypt at the time, things would have worked out differently. We'd never know. It was funny seeing us all together, squashed in our little kitchen. Alex, whose good looks I'd assumed came from Mrs Mendoza, was in fact a dead ringer for Dad. His blue eyes were the same shade as Mum's and Grandad's, though Alex swore he looked just like me. I'd never thought of myself as this haired or that eyed, or whether I was half presentable in the face department. But even I knew that being likened to Alex wasn't going to be bad news by anyone's stretch. And when my parents sat in their chairs each night by the fire, they looked different too. Like a weight had been lifted or a window had been opened. They looked happier than they'd ever done before. It was at our kitchen table a few months later that I heard the latest report from Egypt. That poor man, Mum muttered from behind the newspaper. I assumed she meant Mr Carter, who'd made the headlines again recently when a bust of Tutankhamun was found hidden, all boxed, ready as if someone was planning to ship it out of the country. He faced suspicion, it seemed, at every turn. Don't feel sorry for Mr Carter, I said, finishing the last of my toast and getting up from the table. These days, I walked the last bit of the route to school with Tulip, and I didn't want to be late. Oh, it's not him this time, love. Mum showed me the headline. Pharaoh's curse claims Carnarvon. Underneath, I read the shocking news of Lord Carnarvon's death in Cairo. In weakened health anyway, due to the stresses of the dig, He'd cut open a mosquito bite on his face whilst shaving. The bite got infected and he'd died of a fever a couple of weeks later. It was a sad end to his big expensive dreams and strange how the bite sounded rather like the one Lysandra mentioned on Kaiki's face. In the news piece, much was made of the curse and how random people reporters, writers and actress had predicted Lord Carnarvon's death in the weeks beforehand, all because he'd disturbed a pharaoh's rest. For most readers, it was probably a silly sensational twist to a rather tragic story, but it sent a little warning shiver across my skin. Grandad, I suppose, might have got better anyway though it wasn't a risk I'd ever wanted to take. We'd been right to fear the curse. One Saturday, when life had settled into its new rhythms, I went to the British Museum with Tulip and Oz. It was a fine sunny day, so we decided on a picnic lunch. Oz, I noted, was wearing an enormous overcoat. Oh, it's so cold today, he said dramatically rubbing his arms. It really wasn't. It was another of Oz's quirks and I'd grown used to them by now. We were meeting Alex, who'd recently got work in the Egyptian rooms, writing up Professor Hanawati's research findings. Since the professor's death, the museum had acquired most of his papers, including notes that documented his finds though we were glad to know there was no mention of an Anubis-headed jar. Waiting for Alex's lunch break to start, we strolled through the Egyptian rooms. As ever, I felt at home here and was glad that such places existed so we could learn about the world and the people who'd lived in it. The gold breastplates, the clay pots, the mummified pets, all had stories that we could only guess at. That was part of the mystery. So were the things we'd never dug up, never seen. We didn't have to understand everything at all costs. 
There was plenty of our own stories we still didn't know. Like why Maya chose for the light to flood Kaiki's tomb on that particular day. Or why Pepe had named his camels after a movie star. Or what was going on in Alex's mind when he went to America after the war instead of coming home. Even things like why the Washington Post never chased Mrs Mendoza for her travel expenses incurred on a trip for four to Luxor. As Grandad himself would say, some things were best left alone. Mr Carter did not agree. In the Valley of the Kings, he'd now started emptying King Tutankhamun's tomb in earnest. But after Lord Carnarvon's death, his relationships with the Egyptians, already tense, got even trickier. Or maybe it was the curse having its final say. The story, though, still captured people's imagination worldwide. The Times, its exclusive deal done, published pictures of treasures being carried out into daylight and accounts of all the gold to come. Everyone knew about it, talked about it. The Egyptian rooms were busy like never before. To me, it was still an intriguing tale, but now I was aware of a different side to it. It had lost some of its shine. Knowing Kaiki, Lysandra and Maya were at rest, that to me was the real story and it was worth much more than gold. When Alex finally appeared for his lunch break, sandwich packet in hand, we agreed to go to Russell Square, where we hoped the grass would be dry enough to sit on. What's more, between us, we had a brilliant selection of sandwiches and cake, so tasty that even Oz couldn't resist a nibble. The reason for his huge overcoat also became clear when it started moving of its own accord. I stopped chewing. I say, Oz, you haven't brought that cat along, have you? Nefertiti's head appeared by way of reply. We all pretended to be shocked, but the two had become pretty inseparable since that day in Grandad's front parlour. Oz had been going there regularly for tuition, which suited such a pair of history buffs very well indeed. Your granddad doesn't mind, Oz said, and Nefertiti certainly didn't. The picnic was soon gone, but the afternoon stretched before us, warm and lazy. Alex was the first to start gathering his things. Lunch hour's over, I'd better get back. Stay another five minutes, I pleaded. Yes, do, agreed Tulip. It's too nice to be inside. Oz nodded. Nefertiti meowed. Alex grinned. All right, five minutes it is. It had taken a long, dusty journey to get to this moment. Sometimes, even now, I just had to pinch myself. If the ancient Egyptians were right, and this life was our practice run for the next, then that was fine with me. My heart was here in its rightful place. So we sat, friends, brothers, sisters, and a Siamese cat for a little longer, all together with our faces turned to the sun. The end. So, I really hope you enjoyed that final part of Secrets of a Sun King. I've certainly enjoyed reading it to you over this past term. Um, that book is worth eight points on Accelerated Reader. So if you want to do the quiz, the quiz number is 234933. And when you do the quiz, just make sure that you select the option that says it was read to you, not independently. Um, so... That's the end, we'll move on to our next class book uh, very shortly, which will relate to this term's topic, and good luck with the quiz. <laughs>